now. Detonate the reality bomb! I will build a great, great wall. Some alien race to come down and threaten us. Is the singularity near? The truth is out there. The military industrial complex. The seven mountains of the influencers of culture. To be as gods, you know. Change has come to America. Catapult of propaganda. From a secure location on top of the ridge, in the heart of the beautiful Missouri Ozarks, this is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. It's difficult to fight an effective war when most of the soldiers in your army think that the enemy is imaginary. Watch this. Oh, but you're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Are you kidding me? Have you taken a close look at the eyes on this baby you're clutching so fervently to your breast? This baby's eyes are yellow and slanted and serpentine and feral. This is, this is Rosemary's baby. What the heck is it doing in your tub? Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. That was Joanna Michelson. She is one of the featured guests in a brand new film that is the topic of discussion today, the film called This Is a War. It features a number of other speakers, and uh, including yours truly. Uh, and uh, we will talk with the filmmakers about the project, what the message of the project they, they hope to communicate, and, uh, and of course where you can find it. They are the hosts of the uh, YouTube program through the Black, you'll find it online at throughtheblack.com, and the filmmakers behind a previous film that dealt with satanic ritual abuse and the reality of that horror, the film called Detestable. We welcome back to A View from the Bunker, Tom Dunn and Jared Crestman. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for having us. Man, this is so cool to be back again. I can't believe we have something else to talk about. So thank you, Derek, <laughs> for having us. Well, no, I was honored to be in the, the film, and I was surprised when you released the trailer, the first tease for the film, uh, This is a War, back in June, and uh, lo and behold, it was me. Uh, this was a session that we recorded at uh, the Hear the Watchman conference in Dallas back in uh, March, and uh, you basically just <clears throat> turned a camera on and let me, let me go, which is always a dangerous thing, because uh, as I've said before, my dad used to say, when you ask Derek for the time, he tells you how to build a watch, so, um, but I'm honored that you found a way to use the film, or use that, uh, that uh, footage uh, in the film. Um, the, the film, This is a War, um, Jared, if you were just going to describe it, uh, say the elevator pitch, how would you describe this, uh, this two-hour film? <clears throat> I've told everybody that asks that it's really just a more elaborate episode of Through the Black. It covers a wide variety of topics, but it focuses on the serious nature of spiritual warfare and Jesus Christ being the answer. That's uh, pithy and to the point. Um, now, now, Tom, I was you know, surprised in watching the film because most of the people in the film have a testimony that brings them a lot closer face-to-face -face with supernatural evil. Um, I think me, like most of the people in the Christian church in America today, um, and I think the way I put it was this, we've been so dumbed down in our theology, we don't recognize evil when we see it anymore. In fact, uh, i can pretty sure that's what I said because you put it on the back of the box. Um, and, and again, and again, I was honored that you thought that was worth uh, worth using. But I think that's true for a lot of us Christians because we we don't confront uh, evil in a very spectacular or personal way anymore. It's sort of you know low grade evil. It's like, hey, you know, fellas, it's okay to look, but uh, as long as you don't touch, you know, that kind of thing, you know. Uh, so how did you go about finding? and selecting the other guests in, in, uh, th that are featured in the film. And again, I mentioned Joanna Michelson, uh, but J. Brett Prince, Jeremiah Dirt, Seth, and forgive me if I pronounce any of these names incorrectly, Seth Dreyer, uh, Matt Mraz, and Mark Salinas. Um, Salinas, right. Salinas, okay. Yeah, like Salinas, California, duh. Uh, so uh, w how did your pants cross with those folks, and, and how did uh, what, what were you trying to accomplish with the interviews you conducted with them? Well, you know, the, the, the thing about this film is this film happened on our way to making another film. <laughs> we, set out in, um, we set out back uh, last fall, almost a year ago, uh, just uh, raising support for a sequel that we're going to make to Detestable. 
and some things happened along the way. And the idea behind it was we were going to travel to California to do some interviews and, you know, just cost of traveling and being out there and time away from family. I thought, well, I want to, I want to really, you know, capitalize on the time there and I want to do interviews for other films. And, uh, you know, I had some other people, you know, lined up and for example, Jeremiah Dirt has been a friend of mine for over 20 years. And I, I thought, well, this is an interesting guy. I said, uh, I have some some empty space. I wonder if he would do an interview with me while I'm out there. So I just turned the camera on and just said, hey, you've made music in the past about spiritual warfare. And I just kind of had him tell his story and his testimony. And it's it's fascinating because none of the people in this film know each other really personally. But the way that it just kind of all weaved together, I really believe it was just God, you know, um, in the details of, of putting this together. You know, uh, you mentioned Mark Salinas, who um, he was actually interviewed in the same room that you were. But I met him in the hallway here to watch him and I began talking to him and I was so impressed by just uh, a little bit of his testimony. And I said, you know what, I would rather, would you be interested in telling me your testimony on camera and let me put you in the film? Just because I just thought it was so powerful. I could tell this guy was impacted by God and his life was changed. And I wanted to get that on camera. He said, sure, I'll do it because I want people to know Jesus. So he willingly, you know, he gave me his testimony, you know. And, and you know, just um, Johanna Michelson, we had a, a contact through, uh, through Greg Reed. Right. And we... Um, she is just a, uh, you know, a, a pioneer, you know, in the last 30 years, you know, writing the book, The Beautiful Side of Evil, and just, you know, laying a lot of the groundwork for a lot of us today that are doing stuff, you know, to, in this arena. And we had the opportunity to, to do an interview with her, and we didn't know how we were going to use it, but we're like, we just got to take the opportunity and get her in front of the camera because we want the people... The people that will watch this film wouldn't necessarily maybe go read one of her books until maybe they see her. But she has a lot of wisdom, a lot of experience that we want to bring to people that would be that would watch the film maybe because of Derek Gilbert, you know, or, or one of these other guys, you know. And we just kind of wanted to bring them together. So it was really, you know, and I I, um, I saw uh, Jay Prince's testimony online, and I reached out to him, and he said, "Sure, I would be willing to do an interview," and we did, and it was powerful. Every time I did an interview, I was like, wow, this is going to be, this is good, you know, and then I would do another one and everyone would up, the, you know, the next one. I thought, wow, I don't know how you're going to do this, Lord, but um, we're just going to put this together and see what happens. And it's amazing how even though these people didn't know each other and all of these interviews were were done, you know, sometimes a couple months apart, it just kind of fit together. Mm. Jared, uh, Joanna Michelson, uh, that, that, what a great line uh, that we used in, uh, from the trailer uh, that you guys included in the trailer. This is Rosemary's baby. What the heck is it doing in your tub? Uh, which was part of a comment that she made, a longer comment, about how, uh, as I said, we in the Christian church don't recognize evil when we see it anymore. Um, what was it about her book that convinced you that you needed to try to get in touch with her and uh, get her in this film? Well, Joanna, when I was uh, when I was a teenager, I had plenty of supernatural spiritual experiences with, sh you know, shadow people and the like. And so uh, my, my mother had actually read that book when she was a teenager. And she said, you know, this woman had seen, you know, some stuff I, and this might be an interesting book to you. And so I read it when I was a teenager. And Joanna's book was really the first book that really showed me, OK, maybe I'm not crazy. Other people have experienced some of these things, too. You know, I'll just I'll rebuke them in Jesus name. And that was kind of the starting point of me, you know, really starting to engage with the authority that Christ has given me in spiritual warfare. And so I really owe a great debt of gratitude for peace and sanity in my own life. That The Lord used Joanna's book, The Beautiful Side of Evil, to benefit me and prosper me in my own my own growth. Uh, in development. And so, you know, I'd always thought it would be nice one day if I could personally thank her. 
And, you know, long story short, life goes on and the Lord is good and all these crazy things happen. And we know one of her good friends, you know, and we're doing stuff with him. And he was in the first film and yeah, he had given me her phone number. I talked to her on the phone and before long we set it up and met her at her house in California and filmed her. And I got to just, you know, it was a it was a bucket list thing for me. I got to sit in front of her and thank her for what she did for me as a teenager and she didn't even realize. And it's my privilege and pleasure to be able to share her with other people in a new generation that doesn't doesn't know who she is now uh, tom how did, how did the message come together on this did you come into this film with an idea of uh, where you wanted to take it or did this sort of develop organically um it kind of developed organically i mean i had a plan god had a better plan so <laughs> that's usually um, the way it I, works yeah i knew i wanted to get people to talk about spiritual warfare you know and I, I also had an idea because I was going to make um, a separate film, you know, uh, about abortion. But I, I thought, man, I really want to try and find a way to work this in there now. And there's uh, my daughter works for a group called Created Equal. And I had a contact of a guy named Seth Dreyer. And I took I took some interview footage that we he had done on the show with it. And then I mixed it with footage of him in Washington, D.C., doing pro-life apologetics, just right in the right in the midst of all this craziness and at this feminist march in Washington, D.C. And I just thought it, I thought it went really good. And I kind of um, was trying to be sneaky about that because a lot of people, a lot of Christians have become desensitized to abortion. You know, I think a lot of us have this attitude. Well, it's it's legal, so there's not much we can do about it, so I'm just not going to do much about it. And I, I, I thought this message is so important that we need to stand up for the unborn and we need to fight this and we need to know we need to know how to uh, how to defend them. And I, I wanted to put that in there as, as one of the battlefronts, you know, that we need to fight. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that could be said about that when we talk about the bloodshed and, you know, all of that. And that's it's more than a. Um, it's more than a, than a physical war. It's obviously a spiritual war. And, I mean, we've especially learned that in the last couple of weeks. But I, I, I wanted to plug that in there and just get people thinking, you know, about something that I kind of think that we've forgotten about. Well, Jared, let me bring you in on this. Um, I, I think you're right, Tom. I think a lot of American Christians do consider this uh, the abortion issue kind of settled. But what, what is it about the abortion issue, Jared, that uh, made you believe, hey, you're right, this, this is a supernatural, this is a spiritual issue, a key part of this war that we need to include in the film. Looking at the history in the Old Testament where God prohibited us throwing our own children into the fires to, to Molech, you know, you see that ritual sacrifice of our children is something that's been here since the beginning, ever since the Watchers descended and began teaching us warfare and, and occult, you know, uh, you know, ritual occult practices and um you know, the, 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 the worship that demanded blood, you know, that was something that was required. You see this in history. It's why, you know, we, we act like the, the powers and principalities that we see in the Old Testament are just somehow a myth or they're, they're gone now. And what you see is you have Newton. We got a drop out there, but uh, in some places and you see the child sacrifices. Sorry, child sacrifice is still demanded. You see that in the form of abortion. This is something spiritual because we're willingly handing over our children, even if some of the people that are, you know, committing the willful act of murder of their own child, they, they claim it's for the benefit of their own sanity or the benefit of that child. It's really a, a form of, you know, a form of narcissism and blood sacrifice where we're still offering this to spiritual powers and principalities. And it's, I don't see anything more real in spiritual warfare than the willful act of killing our children for whatever reason. It's, it's a horrible practice. No, you, you basically laid out one of the major themes that I explore in my new book, Last Clash of the Titans, because you're back to uh, the old gods of the Greeks, Kronos, king of the Titans, who ate his children because of the prophecy from uh, Gaia and Uranus, the sky uh, god, that uh, he'd be overthrown by his children. And uh, for their act of sacrifice uh the uh the, you know they're now in chains and gloomy darkness according to peter and jude uh, but still influencing the world today i think taking revenge on the human race for the uh, destruction of their children the nephilim in the, in the flood of noah um, this is a practice that's been ongoing for thousands of years and you're right it's still with us today um, 
w one of the interviews I found really interesting was the discussions that you had with J. Brett Prince. Uh, this is a fellow who is a, a, a tattoo artist who, uh, well, I'll, I'll, Tom, I'll, you know, talk about why, why he's in the film and what he brought out that's, that uh, you found so uh, uh, compelling. Well, um, J. Brett Prince had a, um, had a, a testimony that went viral online. And I, I, I knew a lot of the people that he mentioned in the uh, in his testimony. I kind of rubbed elbows because I'm from Mansfield, Ohio. It's an hour north of Columbus, and I used to I used to hang out down there. And I thought, wow, this guy, you know, uh, his testimony is, uh, you know, I was just going through and verifying things. I'm like, wow, I know this person. I know this person, and I'm just like blown away because this guy is what. Um, what we call a, uh, a, a religious Satanist or a Levian type Satanist, okay? Uh, uh, called, he called himself a Luciferian. And these are the guys that, um, that will uh, troll us, that will mock us, that will make fun of us and say Satanism isn't real, people aren't doing that. And here's one that got saved. And, I mean, his testimony kind of speaks for itself, but he, um, he went looking for the truth and he realized that the truth was Jesus Christ. And he was like, oh, man, he's like, I don't want that to be the truth, because he knew that he had to surrender and he didn't want to. But, you know, uh, he came to a point where, you know, it was uh, it was around the holidays about two years ago. And he got down on his knees and he repented and he's been a changed man ever since. So uh, I just thought his testimony was so powerful especially coming from that occultic background. I mean, he was in to the left-hand path, dark magic stuff, and he was doing rituals, and, uh, and he was uh, openly accepted by the Masons. And he took me to the temple, which was hidden in plain sight. I couldn't believe it. It was hidden right next to the Ohio Historical Center, right off of 71 in Columbus, Ohio, in a little village where um, students from all over Ohio will go. It's, it's called like an Ohio village where they, where they dress up, you know, in, uh, from 100 years ago, and they show people what life was like 100 years ago. Well, in that village, they have a, a Masonic temple there. And um, a lot of people, that, when they found out that his uh, initiation rituals were gone there, they're like, wow, this is really sacred. This is, you should re be real privileged, you know, because they have a lot of artifacts in that place and stuff. Uh, you know, just things like that. And when I was interviewing him and talking to him, I was like, wow, it got real for me because he was explaining to people that he, you know, when they, they took the blindfold off, who was surrounding him? You know, it wasn't kids that was in the heavy metal music. It wasn't, you know, it was these doctors and lawyers and judges, you know, that um, were, you know, and he didn't say this, but I got the impression that the Masons weren't the only thing that they were involved with. And obviously, you know, he talks about once I got into that organization, everything went, started to go good for me, you know, business-wise. Well, that's the thing that surprised me was when you, when you see uh, uh, J. Brett Prince in this film, uh, this, is, this is a war, and we'll hold this up again so you get a chance to see it, uh, you, you'll be a little bit surprised. He was a, a, a tattoo artist, is a tattoo artist, He's, uh, and, and, but he was actually putting occult uh, sigils under his own skin. And yeah. do, do I remember correctly that uh, the, the Freemasons reached out to him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he began, he got fascinated with the artwork. And somebody saw the artwork that he was making. And yeah, they did. They reached out to him. And it was kind of a strange thing in his life. And, it, you know, it shows this in the movie. He happened to be, be living in an apartment building that used to be a Masonic Lodge. He, he was working in, in a building that used to be an Odd Fellows Lodge. Huh. You know, so... Just all of these, um, you know, we know we, a lot of times we'll say, wow, you know, God is moving and God is doing this, you know, and the enemy, the enemy can do the same thing and he can line things up, too. So it's just kind of fascinating uh, how all of these uh, points converged in his life, you know, and um, he ended up becoming a Mason. Uh, but he has since obviously renounced all those vows and and prayed over all that stuff and broken all that stuff. But he was, he was serious into it. And one of the things I don't think I'm, he might talk about, but he has actually tattooed across his chest, do what thou wilt, which is the famous, you know, uh, line from Aleister Crowley. Right, right. Uh, Jared, 
you, you raised in a family where uh, you, you were exposed to a lot of this uh, and, and Christian doctrine very early on. I mean, your dad's a pastor. We were honored to speak at his, uh, at, well, at his church uh, for the uh, Sons of God Giants of Old Conference back in August. Um, how much of this surprised you, the stuff that you encountered, the stuff that you heard from the, uh, the guests in the, in the film? I, I would nothing. Nothing was surprising whatsoever. I mean, this is stuff that uh, you know Tom and I have have worked with and thought about, and you know it's been a part of our lives for quite some time. But I think sometimes you get tired of talking about it to people. Uh, it's nice to have other people out there. You know, prophet has no honor in his own home, so to speak. You know, it's like uh, some people get tired of hearing you talk about it. It's nice to bring people that are older and wiser and have had a different set of experiences that sort of vindicate our own testimonies by giving their own testimonies, which are virtually identical with different variables. And you can say, ha, see, listen, there are other people out there talking about this. And we want to bring right. those to the masses to just help wake up the church. The church needs to wake up. This is something the Barna Group has been pulling out of uh, surveys that's conducted in, in America here over the last 20 years. But uh, it, it's really eye-opening when you see it face-to-face -face and you start talking about things like this with, you know, really loving people in, in our churches and their eyes just sort of glaze over. Um, and it's not through any, you know, not that they're being willfully ignorant. It's just that I think, uh, as in my own personal case, you just never experience anything like this that's so overt as you know, having the Freemasons reach out and, and say, "Hey, we you know we we like this art that you're doing, which is based on this occult uh, you know stuff that you've been studying. We'd like you to join our organization," or you know, seeing uh, as in the case of uh, you know Dr. Greg Reed, uh, the uh, the horror of satanic ritual abuse firsthand. You know, I, I'm I'm thankful, frankly, that God didn't see fit to take me down that path. Um, but and I think that's true for most of us. So what is it going to take uh, to shake people awake. Tom, I mean, it, 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 what, what, is, is it your hope that this film will be sort of a, uh, you know, the, the ice, ice water wake up call? Yeah, you know, and the film Detestable was designed to introduce the, the, um, the words satanic ritual abuse into the vocabulary of, of Christians who've never heard about this. I made that movie and as intense as it was, I, I pulled back a lot of stuff, you know, so somebody could, that, that's never heard of it before, they could be introduced to it. The same thing with this, you know, the, it's the whole idea, even with the title, this is a war, you know, um, and it comes from something I heard Greg Reed say years ago, you know, some people will say um, that, uh, the, well, the Christian life is kind of like a war. No, it's not kind of like a war. It is a war. This is a war. And that's where I got it from. So um, I think I'm really concerned. I really am. Because we are seeing an emergence of what we'll call the left-hand path. Dark magicians are really starting to come out and uncloak. And they're, they're gaining a, a popularity. It's becoming fashionable. These guys have a lot of charisma. And they're pulling people into this like I've never seen before. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of it, but I've become even more aware of it in the last week where we see that they're just... Um, I, I was at the mall a couple weeks ago with my wife, and I saw they have a whole like clothing line that's run by some left-hand path Luciferian Satanists. And they're trying to make it fashionable to be a Satanist, to be you know, a dark magician. Uh, you know, here in a couple weeks uh, in Columbus, Ohio, they're going to have a dark market where you can go if you are a dark magician and get um, anything from you can go see lectures. You can get all kinds of potions. You can get all of the um, supplies you need. So, I mean, I know this stuff has been out there and we, we, we know all about Wicca and all that stuff. And I, obviously we know that there's, there's no, really no difference, you know, uh, witchcraft is witchcraft. But we're, we're seeing the emergence of a group who has an arrogance and who are experiencing power from, from the dark side, and they're dangerous. And I think if Christians don't take that seriously, they're going to be blindsided by it. Because we have, you know, our enemy has the ability on his own to tempt us, you know. But when people come together in agreement to summon a demon and send it against us, 
you know, that can have an effect on us too. We have to learn how to pray against that, how to protect ourselves and to, uh, to, to do warfare. You know, Russ Dizdar talks about this a lot. That's called cult level spiritual warfare. And, you know, spiritual warfare, we all know, okay, we get tempted. Jesus showed us how to, uh, you know, how to overcome temptation and use the word of God against Satan, you know, 40 days in the desert. Um, so there, there's there's something else going on here, and we really got to armor up and be prepared. I'm really concerned about about what I'm seeing, and and it's just, I think it's just getting started. Well, Tom, I just sent you today that link to the new Kickstarter, yes. right? The, Derek, there's a new, I, I saw this for the first time today. I haven't had a chance to vet it, but I went to Kickstarter. It appears that Kickstarter has hit a new record with one uh, campaign in particular that's a top 20 top 20 highest funded they're they're selling demon possessed tarot cards they're advertising that each and every individual tarot card is possessed by a demon it increases the ability of uh, you know the power inside the deck and the person and it's you know this is i mean for it to hit a top 20 highest funded in kickstarter we're talking about demon possessed tarot cards this is 2018 where are we headed well we're in a, a very strange place um this week the former drummer for the backup band for Beyonce uh, basically tried to get a restraining order against Beyonce, claiming that Beyonce Knowles was uh, using high-level witchcraft against uh, people to control the people around her. Um, and, and of course, the general reaction from the public is, "Well, that drummer, you know, this this young lady is is nuts." Uh, when satanic ritual abuse first entered the public consciousness back in the late '80s, uh, it was dismissed as satanic panic. It's like that line from Baudelaire that was recycled in the movie The Usual Suspects. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he doesn't exist. Um, yeah, and so we've got this, uh, I'm looking at this right now on my tablet here, the uh, demon-possessed tarot. They wanted 5000 bucks. They've got 56000 pledged as of uh, Saturday night. Um, is it because... It's amazing. I want to I throw in here, I've been down in Columbus the last two weeks in a row to support my daughter who does... Uh, who does ministry at an abortion clinic a week ago yesterday there was a witch coven doing rituals in the parking lot and i went down yesterday they were not there but we had found rune stones all over the ground right right and i'll put a sh if you're watching this on the youtube channel by the way i'm going to put the picture up here on the screen so you can see this if you're listening to this you might want to find this uh, on youtube or take a look at uh, uh, I know, Jared, you shared this around on Facebook yesterday. I was I was startled when I saw that. I mean, it's pretty it's pretty obvious. Yeah, that was a video Tom filmed with his phone. Um, it's at you know, our YouTube channel, Through the Black. Okay. I went ahead and sent you the video and a picture. Um, but yeah, absolutely, it is startling because it's 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 open public. It's it's unabashed. It's they're unashamed. It's this is uh, this we're seeing a public explosion of this. We we've all you know you and I and, and people that have worked in this or at least known about it. We've seen this moving around in the shadows, but it seems like there's been a move to make this cool. It's okay to come out, you know. And uh, I was actually startled by the number of people that dismissed it on Tom's Facebook, saying this was nothing to worry about. You know, it's like if 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 this is the response from Christian, that, there were some that weren't like that, but there were plenty that. They claim this was nothing to worry about. Go on about your business. Nothing to see here. It's like, excuse me, this is a claim for territory. We don't just give our territory to the enemy. You yeah. know, we just don't do that without a fight. Some of those symbols are very, very old, by the way. One of those in particular with the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, like trapezoidal shape at the bottom, that's, that's the ancient symbol of the uh, goddess Tenet, who was the uh, consort of Baal Haman, the god of the Phoenicians, who demanded child sacrifice at Carthage and at Sardinia. In fact, we saw one of the tophets of the, uh, uh, the Phoenicians when we were on uh, Sardinia at the ancient city of Taros, where some 900 children had been uh, excavated, or the remains of 900 children had been excavated dating back to the time of the judges. So we're talking 12th, 13th century BC. And uh, uh, if I remember the academic paper that I read about the, uh, the dig uh, over 85% of the remains of those children were infants who were under the age of uh, like six to nine months old, and they did not die of natural causes. So, uh, uh, yeah, and that's a symbol that is still being used today by the occult and, and others that uh, I, uh, you know, again, it's not my area of expertise, but I recognized a couple of others that uh, go, back the, uh, the, uh, go back to ancient Mesopotamia. Um, 
well, again, it, it, I just have to wonder, you know, what what is it going to take when you get something like this that's so in in your face, and, and the church is like, oh, well, yeah, come on, they're just play acting. This isn't real. What's it going to take for Christians in America? I mean, you know, Christians overseas, like the Africans, uh, they recognize it because they see the animist religion and the spirits working around them all the time. Our friend, Reverend Dr. Robert Bennett, wrote uh, his first book about that, uh, I Am Not Afraid, about the reality of demon possession and exorcism in Madagascar. They see it, so they recognize it when they see it. We here in America, uh, you know, we, we stopped believing in that and we discovered what? You know, psychology? Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, neuro. Yeah, it, it's 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 amazing. What what is it going to take? You know, I, that example that you give and you talked about, and I remember when you interviewed him on your show, it was amazing. And I've seen the same thing in a church that I used to go to, where you know I am, you know, I'm a, a protege of Rust Isdar, and people even at my church knew. Okay, they were afraid of me, and I don't even, you know, I'm the good guy. But they didn't. They were afraid I was going to talk to them about what I do. And we would have missionaries from our church from Vietnam, like, uh, come over and explain what they were dealing with in Vietnam. And it was in the same denomination, but, you know, in a third world country or in a situation where they just relied on the Bible. They found somebody who had been locked up for a while and they thought she was crazy. And they were like, well, what does the Bible say? The Bible says, okay, we can do this. So they cast the demon out and the lady was fine, you know, and they're sitting there telling this in front of our congregation. But the Americanized, you know, and I'll use a word that our friend Guy used, milk toast Christian, does it, they just don't get it. It's just like, no, this is only in the movies. No, or I'm scared to death of it. You know, I don't want to touch it. And I get that. I, I understand if, if you're afraid, I'm not mad at you. I used to be afraid of it. But get over the fear and just, you know, the Bible says that, Jesus said, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. Nothing will harm you. Okay. And it, it might take some experience to get over that fear. That's okay. But start working on it. Start doing something because if you don't, probably nobody else will. Mm -hmm. Or as our friend mm -hmm. Coach Dave Dobbenmeyer says, you know, hit somebody. It doesn't <laughs> matter. <laughs> Leonard, hit somebody. Uh, yeah. Jared, one of the interesting things, because this this is even beyond that. It's beyond the point of just not recognizing the evil when we see it anymore. It's about openly uh, accepting it in the church, and that was a that was something that Joanna Michelson talked about. Jared, uh, what are some examples of how occultism is actually coming into the church? Eastern mysticism, I think, in worship, uh, you know, you see a, a trend towards mantras in our songs. You see a trend towards this idea of, uh, you know, almost it drives me crazy. And this is highly controversial to some people. So you'll have to forgive me. I don't mean to trigger or start an argument, but I just see a, uh, an elevation of men in our worship and the, the theology and a downplaying of God's work in our lives. It seems to be an overall trend that is always marks. The new age doesn't necessarily have to be communicating with the Palladians. You know, uh, anytime we're elevating a sort of our, a man centric theology, a man centric position, you know, the new age creeps in because ultimately the heart of Gnosticism was ye shall be as gods, that you are good, that you know, that you, we are all gods, you know, that there's, there's this subtle creeping in that seems to twist and warp and, and you know, distort the scriptures and promote truths that aren't scriptural, promote a version of God that's not God, promote a version of Jesus that's not Jesus. There seems to be a, a sort of mystical and Eastern, you know, mystic slant to it that we would largely regard as the new age. And that's taken lots of fun. I went to a, a service that was a, it was a multi-denominational worship meeting uh, uh, several years ago. And one of the the ministers stood up and started ringing a bell for our lost loved ones in the style of the Tibetan monks. I, you can still probably find my fingerprints in the, the chair in front of me because, you know, here is, I almost stood up. I almost stood up, Derek. I was seething and rebuked this minister in front of 300 people. I, I was beside myself. And that is not, that is one of a hundred experiences I have where something ridiculous is happening in front of the church body and people don't care. No one else seemed to mind that night. Yeah. It's, it's, well, one of the things that Joanna uh, talked about in, uh, or touched on in, in the film, in, in the interview was uh, the practice of yoga, which is Hindu 
religion, Hindu mysticism, which uh, I just got another reminder of that today. We, we live out here in, in Podunk, you know, Missouri, in the heart of the Ozarks, and went to a little local festival today in a town of less than 5,000 people. And right there in the parade, right in between all of the cars from the local, uh, you know, Shriners, uh, was <laughs> this little, uh, you know, wagon being pulled with signs on the side saying, you know, yoga with, and, and this sweet lady who looks like she's 75 years old, just waving to all the people along the route, you know, come to my yoga class. And again, this is in the heart of probably the most, one of the most religiously uh, Christian areas in the country. Uh, Springfield, Missouri, we're in that general area, is, uh, if there's a buckle to the Bible Belt in America, Springfield, Missouri is it. And yet, right here, we've got uh, people thinking nothing of bringing yoga class into church and into church-sponsored facilities because that's just good exercise. Yeah, absolutely. You know, nobody was more obsessed with yoga than certain uh, sects within the Nazi party. You know, when you look at the Nazis and their obsession with the uh, Eastern mysticism that came out of, the, you know, the Hindu culture that preserved the idea of their Aryan forebearers, mm -hmm. you know, they were looking to this idea of harnessing spiritual enemy, they, uh, energy. They called it Vril and, you know, um, Volk, Volk, you know, the, the two terms for it. They believe that certain spiritual practices like yoga would allow us to harness energy. Um, that you know would then be able to be used and applied in our daily lives to exert our will on reality. This was something you know. I, I think the Nazis are the most perfect modern example of adopting this, and you see a lot of what we're dealing with today. It actually stems from the occultism in the Nazi Party, spilling over. You know, even to this day, some of that influence is is hard felt. And I think when people, if they do their due diligence and they actually research instead of just operating on chasing their emotions or Jiminy Cricket theology where we only rely on our conscience and nothing else, you know, they wouldn't get so swept up in the deception that's so, e you know, I'm, I'm easily deceived. I know that. And that's why I'm always on guard. I, I want more people to realize that people, humanity is easy to fool. So we might be a little more skeptical and do our due diligence in vetting these things and looking at the research and the history to make a better and more educated decision. Mm. Now, Tom, um, as we, Look, say, turn attention from the warning to how then we apply this warning and, and make good use of this. Uh, as with the film, your prior film, Detestable, um, you know, this this can really shake people up when they see how um, entrenched this is, how how far this uh, th these inroads have been made into the church, how um, blind the American church is to uh, some of these practices. What do we do with this information? I mean, this is, uh, this is a question that, that we heard at the, uh, the recent uh, uh, True Legends conference on, on transhumanism. This is all really good information. This is shaking me up. I didn't realize this, uh, but now what do I do? What, what, do, what, do I, what do I do after I watch This is a War? You know, I talk about this all the time on my show, and I challenge people to get in the fight, get in the game. We we can't do anything on the sidelines. I, I don't know what your skill set is. I don't know where you came from. I don't know. I can't tell you what God's calling you to do. But, you know, teach yourself to hear the voice of God, you know, and, and I challenge people, get into the word. Not everybody can do what we do. Not everybody's called to do what we do, but just, just do your part. I'm here in Ohio, Jared's in Texas, and, and we're doing our part. And I hear from people all the time, and they sound off around the world. Hey, I'm doing my part here, Tom. I'm, I'm, I'm in Australia. I'm in Canada. I'm in wherever in the United States. And people are doing their part. And that's what we're challenging them to do. You know, I, um, I had a friend of mine recently that, that started doing film. And he said, you inspired me to make film. And I was like, praise God, I didn't know. You know, that's great. I want people to do their part. If we had 100 people tomorrow start making films, Christian films, it wouldn't be enough. You know, it really wouldn't. So um, understand that we are living in a war. That's the idea behind the film. You know, get there. That that's that's the foundation. And dig into God's word. How do we do it? We 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 arm ourselves with God's word, with the all, the full armor of God, with the shield of faith. All these things, you know, and uh, in prayer. You know, um, obviously interceding 
and, and calling on God to to uh, just to intervene in our behalf, you know, is is one of the the most powerful thing that we can do, you know. And, and uh, I we're just constantly challenging people to do this, and I'm amazed. I get discouraged because I see I see what the dark side's doing, and I see a lot of inactivity. But I'm also, you know, I get really encouraged because I see so many people stepping up, and I'm hearing so many stories of, hey, we're going to sell. I mean, this is extreme, but, you know, I got a letter in the last couple of weeks where somebody saw our movie from Gons, from Canary Cry, and then it changed their life. And they began to study, and they're selling all their stuff, and they're, they're going to rescue people that are involved in SRA. So whatever it is, find a way to get involved. I don't know what your gift is. You know, you might be a singer. You might be a teacher. Just, just get involved and teach other people and fight, fight, fight. Jared, where, where do people see the movie, uh, This is a War? Um, you can go to Vimeo.com and type in This is a War. Uh, it's available there for rent and for purchase. You can also go to our website, Through the Black. We have hard copies available to sell. Um, this day and age, a lot of people just prefer, prefer you know, seeing it digitally. Uh, but we do have hard copies. We also have an extended bonus disc that has... Uh, the extended interviews. We couldn't compress these amazing interviews, all of them, into you know a 10-hour film. We had to do a two-hour film, so we made the extended interviews available. Um, that's also for sale. If people really enjoy those interviews, they can get the extended bonus disc. Um, but yeah, Vimeo.com, our website, Through the Black, and then uh, Through the Black.com, and then we've got uh, our YouTube channel that's got links all over some of the videos where we do shows weekly and we talk about a lot of this stuff and have our own guests on, including yourself at times. And so that's where we're at. All right, through the black.com, and I'll put a link to that uh, the website, the YouTube channel, and also the Vimeo site for the film. This is a war, uh, about two hours, but two hours very well spent. Uh, in understanding what's going on as far as the uh, the nature of the conflict in which uh, we are deployed, whether we realize it or not. The filmmakers, uh, director Tom Dunn, producer Jared Cressman, uh, fellows, appreciate your time and uh, excellent work. And again, thank you. I'm honored to be a part of it. Thank you, thank so you much. Again, check the notes, whether you were listening at vftv.net, spreaker.com, iHeartRadio, or wherever fine podcasts are sold. Or if you're watching this at the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Derek Gilbert, you'll see the links to all of the sites, throughtheblack.com, and where you can watch and or purchase the film This is a War, uh, here in the notes below this video. Um, well worth watching, and I'm not saying this because I was in it, uh, or I am in the film, but um, the testimony of those who are right on the front line, Joanna Michelson, J. Brett Prince, Jeremiah Dirt, Seth Dreyer, Matt Mraz, uh, Mark Salinas, um, very important, and uh, a wake-up call to the church in America, which is essentially asleep at the switch. And, uh, you know, again, just to be included as part of the group that uh, trying to communicate that message was, was truly an honor. Well, uh, we are, I, I guess we could say we're through the busy, busiest part of our schedule for 2018, but we still would like to see you in Pennsylvania. We've got one more trip scheduled for this year. We will be going to Gettysburg, Sharon and I, along with our colleague from Skywatch TV, Josh Peck, October 18th through the 20th. The beautiful Wyndham Hotel in Gettysburg is the site for the East Coast Prophecy Conference. That's coming up uh, again October 18th. This is a Thursday through Saturday conference. Conference ends at uh, noon Saturday, so we can all get back home and to church on Sunday morning. And of course, uh, some of the folks speaking at the conference will be uh, you know, in the pulpit on Sunday morning. So they need to get back home, but uh, uh, we, we are honored to be a part of it. I'll be uh, giving a couple of talks. Josh Peck will be talking twice, and uh, we're looking forward to meeting as many of you as we possibly can at this conference. Our friends at Southwest Radio Ministries are putting it on, Dr. Bob Glaze and Dr. Larry Spargimino. Um, Stephen Strang, one of the other featured speakers there, he's the author of God and Donald Trump, and... Um, you still have time to sign up if uh, you're interested in going. You've got the time and uh, looking for a drive into the beautiful Pennsylvania countryside at a time when um, the leaves probably be at or maybe just past peak color should be really something. Uh, again, October 18th through the 20th. The website for registration is swrc.com. That's swrc.com. You'll find a link at vftb.net as well in the uh, right-hand column and uh, click the link there. That'll take you to the website for uh, more information. Um, 
and hopefully we can see you there. And uh, if you've got uh, some travel time, some vacation time saved up for next spring, then we would love to see you in Israel. The Skywatch TV Wars of the Gods Tour of Israel next May, May 12th through 23rd. This is a tour that features, well, so th this will essentially be a, a, like a rolling conference throughout the whole, through the Holy Land. Um, Pastor Carl Gallops, the best-selling author of um, the Rabbi Yofan Messiah, Gods and Thrones, Gods of Ground Zero, will be joining us. Rabbi Zev Parat, Messianic Rabbi from Tel Aviv, will be joining us. Our colleagues from Skywatch TV, Justin Fall and Wes Fall, as soon as they get their passports, guys, get on this, uh, we will be uh, taking you to places like Mount Hermon, the Grotto of Pan, Benias. We'll show you the Valley of Elah, where David took on Goliath and won. Um, Maybe if we're uh, if we've got time, we'll do what we did this year and you know stop at the uh, the brook there and collect some smooth stones to pass out on the buses. So uh, some great stuff, great food, great teachings. Of course, we'll see Jerusalem and all of the important archaeological and historic sites in and around the city, the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane, and so forth. Um, this will be an awesome an awesome trip. Uh, Masada, Masada. I haven't talked much about that. The Dead Sea. You can go into the Dead Sea if you if you like. And then if you've got a few extra days, stay with us as we go over to Jordan and we'll see Mount Nebo, where, Ma where Moses got his only look at the Holy Land. We will visit Petra, one of the wonders of the world, an amazing place. And we'll do a little more talking and teaching about uh, those jinn blocks, as in genie, jinn blocks, and some of the gods worshipped by the Nabataeans at uh, Petra, uh, which should dovetail with my book that I'm working on now, the next book. Not the new book, but the next book. Uh, they'll keep that one under wraps until we're getting ready to talk about that. Anyway, May 12th through 23rd, the Skywatch TV Wars of the Gods Tour of Israel. For information and to reserve your place on the bus, don't wait. Filling up LipkinTours.com. That's LipkinTours.com. And we've got some other things that are uh, already popping up onto the calendar for 2019. So uh, we will tell you about those as we get closer to those and as things firm up. But uh, other conferences, if anything, it looks like 2019 is going to be an even busier year. And uh, we are grateful for that. Um, I am finding that I actually enjoy getting up in front of a crowd and uh, speaking. And uh, by the way, I should point out that uh, the job that Sharon did at the uh, True Legends conference this past weekend, amazing. Standing ovation for uh, my wife as she opened up the uh, conference on Friday morning. Deservedly so. She says that I'm the preacher and she's the teacher, like in a classroom setting, but the spirit was on her. And uh, if you were there or if you watched the live stream, you know what I'm talking about. It was, it was powerful stuff. Um, and you know, you know she's getting high praise when a world-renowned expert in artificial intelligence, Dr. Hugo de Garris, comes away from the uh, talk saying, you know, I didn't know some of this stuff that she was bringing out in her talk. I, I, I sat next to Doug Hagman of uh, the Hagman Report. I sat next to Doug and Joe for uh, uh, some of the time. Um, and I, I snuck around backstage so I could be there when she came off. But uh, Doug Hagman was sitting there with his iPhone. He kept pulling it out of his pocket and opening his notes app so that he could write down notes to research from things that Sharon was talking about. So yeah, she did really well. And there's still time for you to uh, uh, go to the gen6.com website and of course order the DVD set so that you can see the presentation. All of them were really powerful. Timothy Alberino, he is so passionate when he, uh, uh, when, when he speaks. Uh, very impressive young man. Uh, Richard Dolan, Dr. Hugo de Garris, who was so nervous when he went out there to talk. Again, this guy with a worldwide reputation but had never speak, spoken in front of a crowd that big before. Um, but by the time he, he was done, he had the crowd eating out of his hand and uh, delivering some powerful information. And Steve Quayle, I mean, what can you say about Steve Quayle? You can't stop him. You can only hope to slow him down. That was my job. And uh, judge for yourself how, <laughs> how well I did. Um, Gen6.com if you want to uh, get your DVD set because the information needs to get into the church. The transhumanism movement is a new religion, and most of us in the church don't even know what the word means. Gen6.com, G-E-N-S-I-X, 
gilberthousefellowship.com. Uh, we're back to our uh, weekly Bible study, Gilbert House Fellowship, gilberthouse.org. Uh, please log on there. We've got free archives going all the way back to Genesis 1-1. And um, please give View from the Bunker a review, whether you're listening at Stitcher, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, or uh, the iTunes podcast store. Give us a like. Give us a thumbs up at uh, Facebook as well, facebook.com slash viewfromthebunker, which is a production of Gilbert House and released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. The opening theme is by Kevin McLeod, and our announcer is DC Good. Remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker.